going to come up is the question of, um, let's see, will the slides be made available? Yes, the slides will be made available after the presentation. Uh, so I'll just answer that one at the outset. So no need to worry about taking like furious notes. You'll get all of the slide content. So now, Jaria, sorry about that. Welcome. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you everyone for attending this meeting. I'm looking at the people in attendance. It says we have 126 locations tied in right now. And that is one of the best things we can hear from the Pennsylvania Doula Commission is one of uh, our concerns and interest, I should say, is to make sure that everyone has access to this training. Um, as you saw, the training will be recorded. We want to make sure that we all have a clear understanding and an opportunity to ask questions and have them answered so that we can move forward with and make educated decisions on how we want to be involved when it comes to engaging with MCOs and being reimbursed through Medicaid and how that's going to work for us through 2024. Um, so this is the place to be to ask the questions where I'm relying and I think PADC as a whole, we're relying on DHS and our MCO partners to answer all of the burning questions that we all have. And if there are any questions that aren't answered after that, um, please, by all means, you know, feel free to reach us out and drop a line. And I'm sure DHS will make a, some communication available to ask future questions as well. But thank you so much for participating in this training and thank you, Gwen, for the floor. Thanks, Sharia. And, and with that, I'll also introduce my colleague, Emily Katz, uh, representing the Pennsylvania Associ Association of Managed Care Organizations. Hi, Emily. Hi, Gwen. Thank you. Hi, Jaria. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I see we're up to 136. Um, that is wonderful. I'm really excited to uh, talk to everybody today. Um, Gwen, myself, um, everybody on this call, we've been working really hard to make sure that we really do answer as many of your questions today as possible. And what we don't answer, you know, we want to make sure that you have all of our information so that we can continue this dialogue. We even talked about having a potential second training, you know, so we really just want to make sure that we are able to get you into our networks, you know, easily. Um, and we're just really excited that doulas now are going to be able to participate. So. I'm going to, um, I think, just kick things off. Again, I'm Emily Katz. I'm sorry I didn't say that. I'm I'm the executive director of PAMCO. And so just like Jaria serves the doula commission, I um, help PAMCO. I'm the executive director, and we work with all of the organizations that you see up on the screen. So UPMC, AmeriHealth, Keystone, Highmark, United, Health Partners, and Geisinger, which may be familiar names to you, may not be, but these are all of the MCO partners that you might be working with um, as we go forward with the doula contracting process. And so you'll get a sense for where all of these MCOs, as we call them, sit um, on the map in Pennsylvania um, in just a bit. And so I think when I, you can go to the next slide, um, and I believe you're going to take take it from here. I am. Thanks, Emily. So before we um, start talking about all of the the logistical elements that you all need to know about beginning to provide services in the Medicaid program, we wanted to offer a framework for anyone who may not be familiar with with the Medicaid program in Pennsylvania. Uh, so first up, what is health choices? Health Choices is the name of Pennsylvania's medical assistance program, our, our managed care program. So you will hear some terms, Medicaid, medical assistance, those are the same thing. Health Choices, that's just Medicaid managed care. So those names are pretty much interchangeable when you're hearing all of those things. And that's just Pennsylvania's Medicaid program. We have been using the Health Choices managed care model for over 25 years. We started in 1997. Uh, Medicaid is what we call an entitlement program uh, that is administered jointly by the states and, and federal government. It's typically based on income. Uh, that is what entitles somebody to receive Medicaid benefits. The Pennsylvania Department of Human Services, which is the department that I work at, manages the Health Choices Program here in Pennsylvania. Uh, every state Medicaid program is a little bit different, so we're just talking about Pennsylvania here. Through our Medicaid Managed Care Organizations, and Emily shared this acronym earlier, MCOs, you're gonna hear that term a lot today. 
uh, but through our MCOs, eligible individuals in Pennsylvania get access to high quality physical and behavioral health care services, as well as long term services and supports um, that's done through community health choices. Today, what we are going to be focusing on is the physical health choices program. Uh, that is the program where doula services will be paid for. And PAMCO, Emily's Association, is the organization of our physical health MCOs. These are the ones that you're going to need to be working with to uh, operationalize this new process. And just a quick call out here uh, about some context for, for what the scope of Medicaid is um, in the birthing space in Pennsylvania. About 34% of all births in Pennsylvania are covered by the Health Choices Program. So the Health Choices Program is a really big payer of, of maternity care services. So moving on to our next slide, which I'm realizing I need to toggle out to do that. There we go. This is our statewide health choices, physical health managed care organization map. So I am pretty sure that some of you may have some questions about which MCO or MCOs do I need to be working with. This map is a tool uh, to help you figure that out. So Pennsylvania is split into five different regions or zones uh, that are groups of, of different contiguous counties. And in each zone, there is a different assortment of managed care organizations that, that serve members in those zones. So if you look at each of these zones by their color code and you look at the uh, key at the bottom of this map, it tells you uh, which managed care organizations serve members in that zone. So when you are figuring out which MCOs to work with, what you need to do is look at the county that your client resides in. Um, I reside in Dauphin County, for example, uh, and so my doula who I worked with, if I were a, a Medicaid beneficiary, she would have looked at this map, looked at Dauphin County since that's where I live, and would have seen that AmeriHealth Caritas, Geisinger, Health Partners, Highmark, and UPMC would be the MCOs uh, that serve my county. Now, you might not have clients uh, who, who are served by all of those MCOs. You know, just because an MCO uh, provides services or coverage to, to members in a certain county doesn't necessarily mean that you will have clients with that coverage. Uh, so if you are seeing that you've got clients that tend to be, you know, in one MCO or another, it is entirely your choice which MCOs you choose uh, to seek contracts with. There is no requirement that you contract with all or even any of these MCOs. The choice is yours. Uh, so this is just intended to be a guide to figure out which ones you would want to reach out to uh, if you if you were to serve their members. So I hope that is is helpful in figuring out who you're going to work with. Um, and like I said at the beginning, these the, the all of these slides are going to be shared uh, with attendees and will be made public for for sharing with any colleagues who were not able to attend today. Uh, so this would would hopefully be a good reference for you to figure out you know who to work with. So just a little bit more context on, on the Medicaid program before we really start to dig in. Uh, the Medicaid program, which I mentioned is also called the Medical Assistance Program, we operate this program through two separate delivery systems, um, and they are called fee-for-service and managed care. As I've mentioned earlier today, we're focused on managed care right now. The reason for that is because until doula services are added to the Pennsylvania Medicaid state plan, uh, they will not be covered in fee for service. They will only be covered in managed care. Uh, we are hoping to, to work toward a state plan amendment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on today. Uh, but just for some context, you know, if you see a client who has like a yellow access card, um, th those are kind of the old versions with the yellow on them, but there are some other versions that say access. That typically is a sign that they have fee-for-service, uh, so you would also want to find out if they were enrolled in managed care before you determine whether you're going to be able to bill for their services. So managed care in, in this system, um, we, we pay at the department. You know, we receive a budget from the General Assembly, from the legislature, uh, and then within that budget, we make monthly capitated payments to our managed care organizations. All that means is that we pay them a flat rate whatever it costs for them to provide care to their members, it's their job to manage that within the, the rate that we pay them. 
Uh, so then the managed care organizations are those that pay the providers, including in the future doulas. Um, and that can be done through lots of different uh, contract arrangements. It can be done through fee for service payments where, you know, you submit a claim each time you see a member and you get paid a rate for, for each of those encounters. Or maybe you negotiate a capitated rate or something else like that where you say, OK, it's a flat fee. Uh, for what I'm I'm going to charge for for my full suite of services that I offer my clients, that is um, you know kind of the general structure for for what the payment options are, but it's going to be up to you uh, to to choose the payment structure that works for you and negotiate that with the MCO. The department at this time is not mandating any rate to be paid for doula services. The reason for that is because, like I said, when we pay those capitated rates to the MCOs, it is up to the managed care organizations to, to manage the care of their members within that budget that they have. And so the department does not dictate what the rates are. Those rates are set and negotiated by individual MCOs. Uh, so that means there is not one, one set fee that all doulas will be paid. There's not one set fee that even every doula would need to, that one doula would need to be paid for every case that they take. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in this model. And I think that's a lot of opportunity uh, to help you ensure that the rates that you are uh, getting paid are, are fair and that they meet your needs. So uh, that is the, the arrangement that we have here for managed care in Pennsylvania. And I think at this time, I'm going to pass the microphone back over to Emily. Thank you, Gwen. Um, that, that was very helpful. Um, so I'm just going to quickly cover, you've heard a lot about MCOs, MCOs, what is a Medicaid managed care organization? And I think because we're going to be partnering so closely together, and this is a first for us too. I know this is new for doulas. This is also new for Medicaid managed care organizations contracting directly with doulas. And so, um, you know, we're all, um, you know, working, you know, together uh, for the first time. And I think um, it's really important that you understand what an MCO is and, you know, why doula services are a really important part of the suite of services that an MCO provides. Um, I'm not going to read what's on the slide because I trust you all can read it, but really this just goes to show that MCOs really um, serve as the coordinators of the care. And you'll see that on the next slide, I think is a better representation of just how MCOs really bring together all of those different pieces of the healthcare systems so that really members do get the care that they need when they need it. Um, and more and more um, outside of traditional healthcare services, including, you know, linking members to um, healthcare, um, I'm sorry, social determinants of health um, and, you know, all of those types of things like housing supports, food supports. Um, and so doula services is really something that we're excited to be adding um, to our member services. Um, the behavioral health piece that you see on here, that would be a separate component really that is provided by a different set of MCOs. But I think it might be important for you to hear and to note that behavioral health medications are actually paid for by the phys physical health MCOs. Um, so that's just something to note um, and how Pennsylvania is unique in how we do things. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so now we're going to get really into the meat of things in terms of how you're going to be working and partnering with the MCOs to contract. You had a training, um, I shouldn't say you, the doula, there was a training provided for the doulas. I believe it was January 10th, and there is a link in the presentation here to that training, and it is also, I believe, available on the department's website. Gwen, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that was to show the doula step-by-step -step how to enroll with the department to get your promise ID, to get your provider ID number, and that is something that you must have, and I'm sure the department um, really implored this upon you that you must enroll with the department in order to begin the process of contracting with an MCO. So that you can see that the enrollment process can take several weeks. It can take up to 60 days. That's also the same for the 
contracting and credentialing process. And so you have to be patient with us. We will also be patient with you, but some of these things will take some time. Um, but hopefully many of you have already started down the um, DHS enrollment um, process. Um, and then you'll be able to begin your. Oh, thank you, Jaria, for dropping that. I just saw you drop that in the chat. Um, um, but hopefully you'll have begun that enrollment process so that then you can begin outreaching to the MCOs that you want to work with, have your um, provider ID, although it's not necessary to begin the contracting and credentialing process, you need it to finish all of that. Um, I think that's all I need to cover on this slide, because really this is a lot about enrollment. Although, you know what, actually, Gwen, could you go back one? I, I do want to point out one thing. Um, the third bullet point that says enrolling with DHS means the providers can then begin the credentialing and contracting process and upon completion of contracting, bill for and receive payment. And so that's just to, to say that the contract has to be in place before the doula can bill for services. OK, we can go to the next slide. Um, and that is the starting point of this top slide. It's just very important. Um, and if federal law requires. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. I'm just going to go through this slide and then I'll um, have a chance to. I can't see the whole question. Um, so there is a requirement that MCOs have to have a contract with with the enrolled provider in order to pay. Um, each MCO, as you heard Gwen say, is going to have different payment rates and different conditions in their contracts. And so, you know, it's not going to be the same across the board in terms of what you're going to be paid. Um, and I, Gwen also mentioned this, that the doulas are going to have to contract with each MCO that you want to um, partner with. Um, and that just enrolling with the department doesn't guarantee that you're going to be paid by an MCO um, and contracting, um, you know, it contracting and enrolling with the provider network of the MCO is gives you the ability um, to, to submit and um, to submit the claim. Let me go and look at the chat. Emily, the Would question you... in your chat is one for oh. Jaria, so perhaps she can answer that either in the chat or later when we get to the Q&A portion. OK. I think we can go to the next slide then. I just want to cover a couple of terms that you might hear during the contracting process. Um, and again, I'm not going to just read to you from the slides because these will all be available, but I know this is being recorded. And so for people listening to the recording too, you know, the, the fee schedule might be mentioned and that's really just the payment rates. It's a list of charges, um, you know, for the healthcare services provided. Value-based purchasing is a big buzzword in the healthcare industry. And it's really just saying that we're not just paying for, you know, fee for service. It's really linking um, payments to patient outcomes. And so a bundled payment, which is the third term that's listed on this slide, is considered a type of value-based purchasing. And there currently is a type of maternity care bundled payment. Um, it's, it's a type of bundled payment that you're going to hear about that's currently in place. Um, and so I just wanted you to be aware there's probably a million other terms um, that we could go through. Um, and I'm happy I have just a Medicaid glossary too that I can give to Gwen if you would find that to be helpful um, that we can attach to the to this presentation as well. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware that you know there are just you know probably a million terms. Um, that you may need to become familiar with or you may already be familiar with. It's really hard for me to tell, but I know um, it may be a daunting process, but we are here to work with you and not to overwhelm you, but just to to partner with you. So we want to give you a heads up in terms of, you know, things you might hear, you know, people might just say, oh, VBP. 
that's value based purchasing. Oh, you know, the bundle payment maternity bundle. And so then you'll know what we're talking about because we live in these things and maybe you don't. Um, I think we can go to the next um, slide. Um, and then I'm going to be done talking for a bit and we have Emily Ott from UPMC who is going to go through their flow chart of what it would actually look like. I know I've done a lot of talking of, you know, you enroll with DHS, but then you would go to uh, MCO's website and you know, so Emily's going to walk through what UPM's pro UPMC's process will look like and then after that um, Kim Beatty from AmeriHealth will actually take you to their website and we're going to do a live demo um, of some of their of some of their stuff. So um, I see a lot of questions coming in the chat, so hopefully we'll have plenty of time to get to get to all of that. Um, Emily, I'm going to pass things over to you and. Um, I see OK, perfect. I'm going to put myself on mute here and feel free to go ahead. Sorry, Emily, so far I am not yet able to unmute you, but I'm going to keep working on that. Just one moment. Well, and I don't know if you saw in the chat, it's the number that ends yep. at 8-1. Okay. Oh, it did. Okay. And you know, what we could do is go to Kim. Um, I, I saw Kim, if you want to, um, and we could just go ahead one slide. Kim, would that be okay? I don't know if you can, can you find, Kim? I don't know if it would work easier for Kim if it's the same issue. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, well let's, um, Gwen, would you be able to bring back up the presentation? I'm sorry, Emily, we'll figure that one out, but we, maybe we could go ahead and um, skip ahead one slide. All right, I think that's where we're at. So good afternoon, my name is Kim Beatty. As shared, I am with AmeriHealth Caritas, Keystone First. And what I'd like to do is give you some sense of what the application or the contract application process looks like. So to begin the contracting process, we, you would need to complete a contract application. And this is an example of a Keystone First contract application, but each MCO has their own version. Uh, Keystone First would then mail you a contract with instructions and ask you to sign and return. It takes about 14 days for us to complete that process. And then once you've received the, con the signed contract, you would then begin the credentialing process. So if I can, can you stop share and I'll actually go to our website and walk through what that looks like. Thank you. Absolutely. So are you all able to see the Keystone first website? Yeah. OK, so the first step would be to go to the provider tab. And here you'll see a section that states join our network. The very first paragraph speaks of, are you interested in becoming a Keystone First provider network, part of the network? The first step would be contracting. And when you click on that contract application, this is what comes up. It is a downloadable PDF that you can fill in. And I'm going to go through briefly each of the boxes just so that you are aware of what information is being looked for. So the first section speaks of the different products or plans. So the applicable would be that you are looking to contract with Medicaid. We would look to have a W-9 attached, and then we'd look for the provider type. So in this case, you would be considered a specialist in our group, um, and you would simply write in this box, doula. This next section would be the legal entity name the group's NPI number, and that's the national provider number, your group TIN or tax ID, the contracting name. Sometimes we have folks that contract under 
one name, but perhaps do business under another. So we ask for the contracting contact name, the phone number and the email, the credentialing contact name, phone number and email. And if these are the same, you could simply write same in the credentialing box. And then we ask for information around the practice location. If this is a business location, that's what you would place there. If it is your home, that would be your address there. And then the second page speaks of those providers that would be listed out as part of the group. So it would be the first name, the last name, the specialty, a CAQH name, which is what we use when we pull credentialing information for our providers, the individual NPI number, and then the Medicaid ID that was mentioned earlier that needs to be obtained first. And then if you have various practice locations and some of your providers only go to one location, the location listed above as location the primary would be placed next to that individual. Say the second provider only goes to location two, you'd simply put the location number here. And then the last page of the contract application walks through some relevant questions for us because we want to make sure that we understand the type of services you're going to provide. So the questions are, what type of claim will you be submitting? I would assume, but I, I won't. I won't say for sure. Most are in a CMS 1500. That's how most professional services are built. Uh, do you have an MAID number for your providers and your service locations? Again, it's a simple yes there. You would have provided that information above. How many providers are you looking to credential? Are you billing J codes or drug codes? Are you billing any vaccines? Do you provide any type of therapy? What place of service do you evaluate and treat patients? Do you provide or prescribe any DME, radiology services or radiology equipment? So these questions help us as we build the agreement type. I would think the majority of these questions um, will be, no, you're not an FQHC, you're not an urgent care, um, but we do ask all relevant questions so we gather enough information to make sure that we're appropriately contracting for service. And then once all this is completed, I'm going to jump just above, you'll see that there's an email address or a fax number that you can submit this information to. And that would conclude the contracting application. So Emily, I'm not sure if you want to go back to the next slide first, or if you'd like me to just perhaps go back to that web page and show the credentialing checklist. Why don't you do that so that Gwen doesn't have to, you know, keep switching? Yeah, I think that would just be much easier. Absolutely. So as you can see on the same page we started, join our network. At the bottom is the credentialing section. And we actually offer two selections. One is credentialing through what they call the CAQH process. And CHQH is an area where your credentialing information can be stored for multiple MCOs to be able to access. So I'm going to bring that one up. And you can see this is the CAQH credentialing section of our web page. The application checklist sits on this web page as well. And simply by clicking, you're given a checklist to complete for each doula that you would like credentialed with us. Again, this list supports us being able to go through the CAQH application and pull your information in order to credential your doulas. So again, the information is, is fairly uh, simple to follow. The name of the applicant, the group name, if you're part of a practice. It asks questions around, are you an FQHC, rural health clinic? These would be no. Are you applying for Keystone first? Yes. Is your group um, joining? Are you already contracted with Keystone first? The answer would be yes there. 
the VIP or the CHC plans would not be applicable. And then again, this is information around your doula group, uh, your TIN, your NPI. If this is a group NPI, then we'd look for the individual NPI here. If it's a solo uh, practice, then it would just be the individual NPI. Again, it asks for your Medicaid ID because that needs to be present. Medicare would not be applicable. And then your CAQH number. This will be where we go to pull the information in order to credential. The other areas, we're looking for the specialty. We're looking for um, REL da data. This is very important to us as we use this information to be able to display it in our directory so that our members can select if they have a preference. Language spoken, again, very important. Um, this information is displayed in our directory. And again, it empowers the participant, the member, to be able to select the provider based on their preference. And then the second page talks about the authorization so that we can go into the CAQH and pull the document. Again, we would need the W-9 form and any other ownership information that would be relevant. And then the information to submit is below. Shall we go back to the to the slide deck? And I can stop share, I believe I can. Don't worry, everybody. Kim's phone number is in the slide deck. <laughs> and um, I'll just say that there there have been many, many questions coming in, and we are going to address them at the conclusion of the presentation. We have a bunch of time built into the schedule to to go over questions. So if you are sending questions in the chat, they will be answered, we promise. Emily Ott, are you able to get off mute now by any chance? Hope I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can. Oh, OK, good. Let me get myself back on camera. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I'm not sure what was happening. Um, so yeah, my name is Emily Ott. I'm with UPMC Health Plan. Um, I'm the manager of contracting and provider data maintenance. Um, and on the screen is a flow chart of kind of the contracting and credentialing process just in general. So I'll kind of just walk through it. Um, so the first thing would be um, similar to the presentation you just had to go to our website um, to complete what we call a pre-application, which just gives us some general information. Um, once we receive that, um, we would send out a doula provider credentialing application, um, a physician agreement, and our disclosure of ownership form to complete. And then once the physician agreement and the, the DOO are received, um, we can begin the credentialing process and that will be sent to our credentialing department. They have um, up to 60 days to complete the application as long as the file is clean. Um, and then it'll go to our credentialing committee to um, be reviewed and hopefully approved. And then at that time, the agreement will be finalized um, with the effective date of credentialing and the approval letter will be sent out to you within 30 days after um, the application has been approved. And then at that point, once we have like the contract, the DOO and credentialing is all, everything's all completed, um, you would be considered participating and appear in our provider directory for members um, to choose you. So that's that's the whole process there in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And Thanks. all of the um, MCO's landing pages are going to be provided to you. Um, each each MCO has an appendix at the end of this presentation, as well as an Excel spreadsheet that we put together that has the landing page for each MCO. So 
just like Kim just took you to the Keystone first one. That website is is listed for you um, here in the presentation as well as in a separate Excel file, so you don't need to Google or search for it. We've provided those landing pages for you um, and they'll be in the slide deck with live links um, so that you can just click and start those processes with the MCOs you're going to be working with. Um, this is, uh, we, we really covered most of this information about credentialing. Um, this is part of the process um, for the MCOs to complete um, um, the, the contracting process so that you can um, appear in their provider directory and submit claims. And um, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, Kim showed you an example of the Keystone checklist. This is a, an example of another MCO's checklist. Um, uh, there's just information you're going to have ready. A lot of it resembles the information that you had to provide, <clears throat> pardon me, to em enroll um, in the state Medicaid program to get your Medicaid ID. Um, a lot of it is very similar. Um, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Gwen, I, I believe you're taking these. That's me. <laughs> So before I, I dig into this content, I, I want to just kind of recap on on some of what you just heard about the contracting and credentialing process. I want to be clear that that getting your Medicaid ID number from the Department of Human Services is the first step in the process. And if we're being honest, you know, the contracting and credentialing process takes some time. You saw there are, are definitely several steps in there, you know, and that, those are the steps that you take once you've identified which MCOs you're you're going to be contracting and seeking credentialing with. So there there are step, several steps involved in this process, and so it's it's certainly not something that happens overnight. Um, that's why we are beginning this process now, early in 2024, so that there is plenty of time to complete these processes and and start getting you paid. For services in 2024. Um, so I know Emily said at the beginning, please be patient with the MCOs. They will be patient with you. Um, that's going to be really important to, to a successful partnership here in 2024. So at this time, I'm going to now talk a little bit about what's going on this year in 2024 in terms of what the MCOs are required to do by the department. And I'll talk a little bit about the department's plans looking forward to 2025 and beyond. So the, the Health Choices Program, our Medicaid Managed Care Program, is governed by a document, it's a contract, uh, between the Department of Human Services and between the MCOs. And in that contract, DHS, the department, lays out all of the different requirements that the managed care organizations need to meet. And so for 2024, uh, we made some changes to the contract that we have with the, the MCOs to provide that doulas must be a part of their maternity care teams. So a little bit of context about the MCO maternity care teams. There is a requirement in the Health Choices Agreement, this contract that I'm talking about, that says that MCOs need to use these maternity care teams to provide perinatal services, so prenatal, labor and delivery, postpartum services, for at least 25% of their covered births. These maternity care teams are made up of groups of, of several different provider types, all of whom together provide those perinatal services uh, to, to pregnant and birthing members. So that can be, you know, an OBGYN. It can be the, the labor and delivery unit in the hospital. It is now going to also include doulas. So you're going to be part of a team um, if you choose to participate in, in this model. Uh, that that provides you know comprehensive perinatal services uh, to to manage care members. The the doulas who participate in this uh, this perinatal maternity care bundle program can be employed by the birthing hospital uh, or a physician group, an OBGYN practice. They could be contracted by the hospital or practice, or they can operate completely independently um, and just participate on the team that way. Uh, in, in the following slides, I'm going to go through 
uh, a list of participating maternity care bundle sites uh, so that you can determine if these are uh, hospitals that you might like to align yourselves with uh, to participate in, in this bundle. So to be clear, for 2024, uh, payment for doula services is mandated for doulas that are participating as members of the team for these maternity care teams. Uh, the, the maternity care teams that are participating in this model with each of the MCOs uh, are going to be aware of this and they're going to be seeking doulas uh, to serve as members of their team, whether that is employed, contracted or independent, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that is what we're doing here in 2024 to lay the groundwork. The reason that we are doing this through managed care, kind of this limited rollout, uh, is because, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, until doula services are, until they become a part of the Medicaid state plan, uh, it's limited in terms of what MCOs are required to pay for. We are working toward a state plan amendment that we hope will be in place in 2025. Some of that depends on doula provider capacity. You know, if we are going to put something into the state plan, which for a little bit of context, the state plan is a, a contract that the state holds with the federal government about the way that we will administer our Medicaid program in Pennsylvania. If we add a service to the state plan, it must be available to all members statewide that are eligible to receive that service, regardless of where they live. And so until we have a network of, of enrolled doulas in our Medicaid program that are capable of serving all of our pregnant members statewide, we can't put those services into the state plan because we wouldn't be compliant with our own state plan if we were including a service that we couldn't actually offer to people. So the way you can think about 2024 is the building year. This is the year for us to get ready uh, for, for when doula services become fully covered uh, for all pregnant and birthing people in Medicaid statewide. Uh, so we're using this maternity care team model for 2024 to allow for this kind of ramp up and to allow for you all and for all of the MCOs to get used to this process of contracting and credentialing with and, and billing and paying doulas. So that is the, the plan kind of for this year and, and hopefully next. And now I'll show you uh, some lists. Oh, darn. I think that um, the version that I have open, my, oh no, this is uh, another slide that I meant to cover. I talked a little bit about the uh, maternity care team members, uh, you know, physicians, uh, that are providing different delivery services, prenatal care, uh, treating uh, people with high-risk pregnancies, hospitals that perform C-sections as well as vaginal deliveries, anesthesiology practices, labs, uh, social workers, or other kinds of peer support services, uh, and then relevant and, and important to you all, uh, doulas. So you will be able to, under this model of care, submit claims for your services. So even though this, this model is called a bundle, um, I wanna be clear that, that you would still be billing for uh, and, and being paid for your own services. Uh, it is possible, like Emily mentioned earlier, that there might be some value-based payment strategies that are offered, uh, but kind of like we said at the beginning, the, the negotiation of the actual payment strategy is up to you and the MCO. Um, and so that might be a value-based payment strategy if that's something that you're comfortable with. You know, perhaps you are employed by a hospital that participates as, as a maternity care bundle provider. And so you would come into the arrangement that way. Uh, but if you're completely independent, then you will just bill for your own services. I also want to note that uh, in this program, there are incentive payments, kind of bonus quality payments for good outcomes that are uh, that are achieved by members through through their care teams. And so as members of these maternity care teams, you would also be eligible to receive those incentive payments. So now I think I will get to, yes, this is what I was thinking. Uh, this is a chart that shows different hospitals across Pennsylvania. Uh, so in the first column, you've got the name of the hospital. Uh, the second column is the hospital zip code, so you can figure out what's local to you. And then the remaining columns are the different MCOs. And so when you're looking at this chart, you know, say for example, 
uh, you know, you you practice and and often are involved in deliveries at the uh, Pennsylvania Hospital uh, located in Philadelphia. You would look at that very first row and you would see that Pennsylvania Hospital participates as a maternity care bundle hospital for Keystone First and for United. Um, and so that might be an indicator to you, OK, that I want to seek uh, credentialing and contracting with Keystone First and United because I do a lot of deliveries there at the Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, so this chart uh, is, of course, involved. it's included here in these slides. Uh, the second chart on the next page is the remaining hospitals here. I do want to be clear that um, just because these are the only hospitals that are listed here as uh, participating in the maternity care bundle program, doesn't mean that these are the only places uh, that you could receive payment for. You absolutely can and should uh, be be working with MCOs to seek uh, contracting and payment for deliveries that are outside of these hospitals at other birthing centers. These are just the ones that are currently participating in that maternity care bundle that I talked about, which is the one that's mandated for doulas to be included uh, for 2024. So I think with that, I will move us on to the claims and billing section. And I think, Emily, you're up again. Yes, and I think we're reaching the, the very, very end because we're talking about a potential future training. The rest of the slides are really um, a lot of appendices with our contact information, et cetera. So we're reaching the Q&A portion. Um, so I know uh, we should have plenty of time to answer um, the questions that are in the chat, but I just wanted to quickly touch on claims and billing, which will be the final step once you've enrolled with the department, once you have contracted and been credentialed with the MCOs you want to work with and you've provided a service to a member um, and you want to submit a claim and get paid for it, um, most likely you're going to be using um, what you heard Kim say is a CMS 1500 form. This is a little snapshot of that. Um, and so, you know, this in itself is probably going to be a whole other potential training because really the focus of today is getting the doulas into the MCO's network, um, figuring out um, the contracting and, and getting you enrolled. Um, but we will have to, to figure this out and we want to make it as easy as possible. The MCO's um, are going to discuss um, potential codes that we could use that are similar. You know, we want to make it as similar as possible, although I know that's not always possible. Um, but, you know, there is going to be differences between each MCO. Um, the a similarity may be that um, they will ask you to use this, this form to submit the claim. And so there may be um, a future training where we'll talk about the form, we'll talk about what codes to use, what are the requirements for submission, there are timelines for um, how long, you know, you can't just, I think, you know, you can't just sit on, you know, the service, you have to submit the claim um, in a timely manner, um, and what documentation you have to keep and for how long, um, and so all of that we would like to do um, with you soon. We just haven't had a chance to discuss it ourselves either, because again, this is new for us. And so um, we're gonna get ourselves back together to discuss um, some of these things. And then um, if you would find that helpful, um, we think we would like to offer another training um, really just focusing on claims and billing. And then we could also see how things are going, um, you know, and, and answer any questions in another month or two, um, you know, with your enrollment um, and, and things like that. So I just wanted to put it out there that this isn't the end. This is just the start um, of the resources that will be available to you. Um, Let's look at the next slide just to make sure that I'm correct about. OK, so these are the contacts, but you will get it in a spreadsheet um, just so you don't have to use the PowerPoint every time um, that has the MCO contacts. Um, that would be the appropriate one for you to use in terms of getting in the MCO's network and then 
Um, my information and Gwen's information is over there on the side as well, in case you wanted to follow up directly with either of us. Um, and then following this slide, then um, are the questions that the, co the commission had submitted to um, Gwen in advance. And I think there is some um, overlap between some of the questions I saw. I haven't read all the questions in the chat yet, but there are answers to each of those questions. So I'm not gonna take time now because we'll have a Q&A session. And so hopefully we've either covered those or will cover them, but the answers are also embedded here in the presentation. Um, so the um, answers are here that were submitted in advance. Um, and then all the following slides are all the appendices um, and contact information for each of the MCOs so that you have everybody's information. Um, we wanted to make sure that you were able to reach out directly. Um, and so I think with that, um, we can move to the <laughs> move to the chat and I'll lean on, you know, Gwen and others, you know, whoever has the answers, I, I'm sure I don't have them all. Thanks, Emily. So I just want to yeah. put a, another recap on what Emily just said. And, and part of that is that this is just the beginning of the process. This is not the end. We know that this is going to take a lot of coordination uh, to get it right. And I also want to make sure that you all know that once you, you know, become a network provider for an MCO, every MCO offers, you know, provider onboarding. Uh, support to to help you learn some of the the rules of the road for how to work with them and how to bill them uh, for future services. So you will be able to avail yourselves of that support once you've gone through the credentialing and contracting process. So I think if we could uh, if we could go up to the top of the questions that have been asked, let's see. Uh, the first one was a question for Jaria, uh, which was, would you need to enroll in the PA doula commission as well as completing the DHS application process? Thank you, Gwen. Um, so I want to clarify that as far as the Pennsylvania doula commission is concerned, there's no enrollment or membership or anything. The Pennsylvania doula commission is a resource that is created to support doulas and to protect the doula profession and to really push forward um, our desires and needs as doulas and collective experts for the work that we do. So that being said, on the previous training that we had on January 10th um, for the enrollment portion of the training where slides are available on the link that um, I put in the chat, um, it was explained that the only thing that we will need as doulas, um, myself included, is to have that certi certified perinatal doula credential, which is available and we'll be sending an update actually to all of the subscribers to our newsletter because there are some updates on that as well. You'll just need that to actually qualify to start taking these steps. And the way to obtain that CPD or certified perinatal doula credential um, there's an experience-based pathway, and then there's a pathway for individuals who have either attended a training, a doula training, or individuals who have attended a training and moved on to have a certificate from that training organization or a cert certifying body. So all that to say, like, there's everyone is included. It's going to be completely possible for everyone who is interested and moving forward with this process to have that first step taken care of it's pretty easy um the pennsylvania doula commission is also while funds last paying for that uh, that application the initial cost is 50 dollars. and so if you go to the P pennsylvania doula commission website and click on the link at the top of the menu that says subsidy um, application that'll let us know that you're interested in having us pay the application fee and then we'll take care of that for you but there is no other like Pennsylvania doula commission steps or anything that you have to do through us because we are just basically mouthpieces for what all of us agree that we want, just like we did when we started in 2021. Thanks, Jaria. Awesome answer. 
Uh, let's see, the next question I'm seeing here, is there a way that we could see the, what the range of pay for doulas would be based on our portion of the PA map a few slides back? What I will say to, to get us started on this question is that I don't believe that, that each MCO has established a, a range of rates at this point. I think that's going to be a really collaborative process between you and the MCOs. Uh, because this is a new service for these MCOs to pay for, um, a lot of them don't have too much information or data about what these services really cost. Some of them have been working with doula organizations through you know, contracts rather than through billing, and so they might be able to use some of that uh, information that they have to see what the cost of these services might be. But I will say that at this time, as of today, there's not a range that I can show you. I think that is something that over time, as some of these contract negotiations begin, that we can start to put together uh, so that you can have a sense of, of what the rates are looking like. But as of today, unfortunately, that's not something that I can provide. Would any of the of the MCOs like to, to chime in on, on that, or are we okay to move to the next question? Well, I mean, no, Glenn, I this think is Mike from oh, Jefferson Health Plans Health Partners. I think your response was certainly appropriate. And this is Kim Beatty from Keystone AmeriHealth. You're spot on. Thank you. Yeah, Jody Krieger agrees from United Healthcare. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, folks. Um, here's another one, and and I think this question came up during uh, Kim's portion of the the presentation. If you are an organization who provides doula services or has doulas on staff, can the organization become a provider? Um, and so, yes, I hope you did hear that, that there are both group and individual uh, applications for, for credentialing. So, Laurie, I, I hope that that has answered your question, uh, but if you'd like to come off mute or, or put anything in the chat now to let me know if I missed the mark, uh, just let me know. So here's another, uh, several of these questions came up and and Kim, I'm, I'm not just putting you on the spot. They came up while you were talking, but you know, certainly every MCO uh, performs credentialing activities. And so any MCO can can uh, weigh in on the, the answers here. But the first one uh, was a note that came up, I believe when you were talking about the contracting process and there's a field uh, for entering a physical practice location. And Angela noted that that most doulas don't have a physical practice location. And, and Laura added that postpartum doulas, for example, tend to practice primarily in client homes. Um, and so I think that there's a question in there about what, what address would you use as a physical practice location when filling out that paperwork if there is no office? So typically it would just be their home address. That would be fine, we understand. Thank you. So home address is the way to go if you do not have a, a physical uh, site where you provide services other than client homes, for example. Here's another one for, for Kim or anyone else working on the credentialing piece. Uh, do we need to do a CAHQ or is it CAQH? I always forget profile. Uh, we talked a bit about that, uh, but if they have one, one of those profiles as another type of provider. So for example, a, a lactation consultant, could they use that same profile or would they need a new one? I don't believe they would need a new profile. They would just need to make sure that the information regarding their services as a doula is in that CAQH. They could use the existing. Wonderful. And, and here's another question uh, from Sarita. Would you have to submit another separate application as new doulas may join your practice? So this would be, I think, in the context of if you had a group. I'm so sorry, the light in my office keeps going off. Um, if if you had a group application or a group enrollment or or credential, uh, do you need to update that that group status as new doulas uh, would join your practice? I guess is maybe a way of restating that question. So once the the group is par. We would then only need to add that provider through the credentialing process. So that would be another credentialing app that you would submit. You wouldn't you wouldn't need to go through another contract. It would just be an additional provider to the existing. So one more person to get credentialed, but no changes needed to the contract. Correct. 
All right, Lori had a question about how do you get a Medicaid ID? Lori, that is the uh, presentation and training that we've alluded to uh, that took place on January 10th. Um, and so the the link to that presentation will be embedded in the slides that you get here. And Jaria had also included that in in the chat earlier. So uh, that is, you know, kind of step zero, if you want to think of it that way, to get your Medicaid ID. So all of the information you need about how to do that process is in that training that took place on the 10th. Um, another question, uh, can the physician agreement, and I think this was part of contracting that may have come up in the context of UPMC. So I might ask Emily uh, for you to chime in here. Can the physician agreement be signed by a midwife as well? I believe it can. It would be, I think, signed by maybe the owner of the group or, you know, if it's a physician or whoever it is, I think that would be okay. As long as they have signing authority for the group. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A question from Lindsay. Doulas need to be certified, correct, before starting the application for Medicaid? Yes, Lindsay, you're absolutely right. That's what Juria was talking about with getting that PA certification board credential as a certified perinatal doula. That's the prerequisite for getting uh, enrolled with Medicaid. And getting enrolled with Medicaid is the prerequisite for um, getting credentialed by the MCOs. So Sarita, I'm coming up here on, on your question and I just saw your hand up. I wanna ask maybe if the, the raised hand had anything to do with the next question or do you have something else that you wanted to ask? That's a question to what you just said because when Jaria says something about the perinatal certification, uh, would you still have to go through that process if you're already certified? Because I'm certified through DONA. So do you have to do that as well, that paperwork as well? and if you're already certified through another organization. Sharia, would you like to, to speak to this one? Yeah, so Sarita, the way the um, CPD credential works, it creates a way so that MCOs can understand the work that we do. So it creates unity across all the different certifying bodies um, that are represented throughout Pennsylvania. And so there won't be any special preference given to DONA, CAP, or anything, or even to people who have completed a, a training versus people who are experienced or have um, ancestral training or anything like that. Everyone will go through the same, each of us will have the same CPD credential that will be recognized by uh, CMS and MCOs above. Thank you, Jaria. So, Sarita, your your question that was in the chat had to do with the the MCOs and the reimbursement rates. I think we talked a bit about how those are definitely still under development um, and will be collaborative uh, in your contracting process with the MCOs. Here's a question from Angela. How closely would we be expected to be enmeshed with these hospitals or practices? For many of us, our integrity as being separate from the hospital or, or other medical provider is an important part of our practice. Certainly hear you. So um, in 2024, with, with the maternity care bundle being the model that MCOs are required to pay doulas through, there would be an expectation that you would be partnering uh, with, with those providers. But I don't think that it would be necessary that you do much beyond what, what your typical partnership uh, with those providers looks like when you are present for a birth at one of their facilities. Um, you know, for example, you are allowed to, to maintain yourself as an independent doula. You do not need to be employed by or contracted uh, by that birthing hospital or, or an OBGYN practice. Uh, you can be in an informal arrangement with them where you just serve as a, I don't mean to say just, where you serve as a member of, of uh, that, that patient's care team. And so I think that that independence is something that, that we wanted to create space for in the, this arrangement and that independence will will certainly uh, be even easier to maintain once these services are included in the state plan um, and you begin to be able to bill for services for, for all uh, clients that you're seeing. The next question is, are, are postpartum doulas encouraged to be part of these bundles as well? Uh, I wanna go back and, and double check myself, but I believe that the term that we used in the agreement language is we just used doula 
Um, and so when you go and look at the, the definition of doula in our agreement, it's a perinatal doula. And so perinatal would refer to prenatal labor and delivery or postpartum uh, services. And, and so, yes, um, postpartum doulas certainly can be a part of, of those uh, care teams as well, because they provide some extremely valuable services, as I can attest to as the recipient of postpartum doula services. Uh, what if there is no physician involved, such as an independent doula? So I think I might need to, to ask the contracting uh, folks from MCOs. Emily, again, this goes back to the needing the physician agreement. I don't know if you are able to speak to this from UPMC's perspective or if any of the other MCOs would like to talk about a requirement for, for a physician agreement when, when perhaps a doula um, is, is not affiliated with, with a physician. This is Emily at UPMC again. Um, it would just be the the independent doula themselves could sign the agreement as well. But if there is a a physician or or an owner of the group or whoever, they could also sign the agreement. Hi, Wonderful. this is Jody. I'm sorry. This is Jody Krieger from United. It would be the same thing for us. Independent could um, sign independent doula. Basically, whoever owns the practice owns the 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 doula services and you know how you got your W9 you know set up and your NPI set up so that would be how we would expect and who would sign the contract same for health partners Gwen same for Mara Health Keystone this is Danielle Snyder from Geisinger Health Plan it would be the same for us as well wonderful thanks folks um, a question from Ayana. For doula agencies that are already contracted with MCOs, will contracts no longer be effective and doula agencies will have to take this process? Uh, I would I would certainly encourage you, Ayana, to reach out to the specific MCOs that you are contracted with, but I don't believe that, you know, unless or until these services are added to the state plan, my understanding is that your current contracts will remain in place and, and you'll be able to continue using that process, you know, until the contract expires and then you would begin billing, but I, I would refer you to the, the specific MCOs that you work with to, to confirm that. Um, but that is the direction that the department has given the MCOs that if they have any contracts with dual agencies currently, those can continue in place uh, for the time being. And one more here, we have a group that is a family practice and an OBGYN group. They consider themselves as separate entities. Do I have to have each of uh, those departments sign an agreement? Hey, Gwen, I'll sure. jump in real quick for health partners. I, I, I think it really involves a conversation. I mean, we can approach it a couple of ways. We do have a, a single professional agreement that can include both primary care and specialty, but I think it's really going to come down to how the organization prefers those contracts to look, whether they want separate or combined. We can go either way. It would be the same with United. You know, if there is a group that has a group of PCPs as well as the doulas, you know, we can have one contract, you know, and, and one fee schedule, so to speak, to, you know, to pay for that. And if the PCPs already have a contract, it's very likely that we can, you know, add the doulas to that existing contract already. So, again, I agree it's going to be individualized to each MCO and whether there's a contract in place already or not. And this is Kim Beatty again. It would be the same for us as well. I was going to say ditto that from Geisinger Health Plan, same. Thank you, everyone. We've had a few uh, patient folks with their hands raised for a little while, so I'd like to, to call on them before we continue in the chat. Heather, your, your hand is the first one that I'm seeing here. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. I would like to know if there are any exclusions for um, pregnancy loss or stillbirths, you know, if the birth is not going to result in a live birth. Would any of our clinicians perhaps from, from MCOs like to weigh in? I can get us started, uh, which which would be to say that that there certainly is no requirement anywhere in in DHS programs that there be a result of, of a live birth, uh, you know, particularly if you are providing prenatal services or Unfortunately, you know, if you are involved in a, a tragic stillbirth situation or something like that, 
that that a live birth, I would not believe from our perspective would be a requirement. If the services were rendered prenatal or or during the delivery process, the services were rendered. Um, are there any MCOs maybe who see it differently or would everyone agree? Totally agree. When it's Lakshmi, I agree. Agree, yes. Agree. Agree. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for that question, Heather. Uh, Laura, I see your hand raised as well. Hi. Will the MCOs or DHS determine how many visits would be covered, say, prenatally or postpartum? So DHS will not be establishing that, but that would be a part of the contracting process uh, with MCOs. I, th I think that you would, you know, particularly if you were looking to establish what we sometimes call a case rate or, you know, a flat fee that you would charge for all services, you would certainly need to determine how many visits are covered. But that that would be something to work with each of the MCOs with during the contracting process. Once the uh, services are added to the state plan in the fee for service system, then the department will weigh in on how many how many visits would be covered um, for the fee for service program. Heather, I see that your hand is still raised. Would you like me to help you lower it or do you have a new question? Um, can you lower it, please? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, I will return to the chat here. Um, let's see, there is there are some remarks from Angela that I would refer to refer folks to read in in the chat. Not not a question necessarily, but some remarks that I I think that uh, the MCOs would benefit from reading here. Um, and a question from Teresa Petaway, considering the importance of administrative tasks and data tracking in supporting the work of community based organizations. How do organizations I would assume MCOs typically approach reimbursement for these aspects. Are administrative duties and data tracking included in the reimbursement structure, uh, ensuring that they're adequately compensated for the essential behind the scenes work that contributes to the success of their programs? I will say, um, and, and I'll just try to speak generally uh, from, from what I observe from the department, uh, but then I'll, I'll open things up to the MCOs as well to weigh in. Certainly when we are setting rates at the department level, uh, that is something that we consider. We consider all activities uh, that go into the provision of services, not just the actual face-to-face -face time with uh, the patient or the client. I believe that the MCOs follow a similar structure, uh, but I'll, I'll allow the MCOs to speak up as well. That is correct, Gwen. Same for United. Same for Mara Health Keystone. Same for Geisinger Health Plan. And Teresa, thanks so much for for calling that out. There, there is a lot of really critical background work uh, that happens here. So, so that's an important point. I believe we've made it to the conclusion of of the questions that are in the chat. Um, but please, uh, if you have more questions that remain, now is your time. Or if I inadvertently skipped over one of your one of your questions. Um, Please just let me know because we've got some some time here if we need to use it. Sharia, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I have a question about some of the expectations or whether or not this is kind of, if it's consistent across MCOs. Um, in speaking with physicians and other providers, uh, the the charting or the billing and the notes, all the requirements that are necessary for, say, a physician, sometimes they say it could take upwards of five hours to just go through the billing process for one person. And also what's required for, um, you know, filling out a claim and, the, you know, codes and all the notes and things that are required. Is this something that's going to be pared down for doulas because we don't do the things that say a physician or a therapist, for example, would do. And so are we going to be held to the same standard as physicians when submitting claims? Would any of the MCO uh, representatives on the call like to to start us off on answering that question about the, the level of documentation and supporting materials that are going to be necessary for claims submission purposes? 
Yeah, I mean, I can jump in quickly, Gwen. I, I guess I would say from the start, we, we still need to make sure that what's being built to us was was uh, what should have been built to us. And ultimately what we're paying for is what was actually rendered. Um, and so th there is certainly some level of auditing that will likely go on as we do for all providers across the network. Um, I, th I think we're too early in the process to understand exactly what that's going to be, what that's going to look like and what specifically auditors will be looking for. Um, I, I, I don't know if any other payer out there has more advanced uh, efforts into this yet, but I don't see it being any different um, from a payment perspective. We still need to make sure that what we were billed for and ultimately what we paid for was actually rendered to the member. Yeah, yeah, this is Jody from United. I would agree, you know, documentation of what you provide and the services you provide will, will definitely need to be in your in your medical records, your charts, whatever, whether it's electronic or paper. Um, and there there could definitely potentially be some auditing. You know, from a billing perspective, I think it's way too soon. I mean, I think us as the MCOs need to have a, a better understanding. And, and that's going to come with talking to you all individually during the contracting process to get a feel for the services you provide, maybe pulling in our clinical resources too to help us with that in the whole contracting process. But, you know, we definitely need to have documentation to support what is coming into us, as um, Michael said. Yeah, this is Nick with UPMC. I would agree with that. And, you know, I think it's a matter of, you know, doulas are doing things differently, say, than from, for physicians. It's a matter of documenting, you know, what you typically do as a doula, um, you know, that, that, uh, shows what was done, you know, during the visit or, you know, again, through the, the pregnancy, you know, certainly documenting each visit, <clears throat> you know, documenting uh, what was done, for example, during labor, you know, time of labor, things of that nature. Thank you all. I, I just, and I, I appreciate all of your answers to that question, because I'm, I'm guessing that's something that we're all thinking about. One of the things that, um, I'm thinking of and follow up is I think the PADC and like our advisory board members would be happy to sit with DHS and the MCOs and plan for success because this is so new, not just for you all, but for us too, to make sure that when a doula is submitting a claim for a bill who's never done that before. I know we have a few people in the room who are experienced with that. We want this to be a, a, a painless experience for those of us who have not done that before. And so if we can develop some sort of template or some sort of guide on what it is that you all want to see in the first place so that we can set this up for success, I I'm imagining that there's some people in the room that would be in, in agreement that that would be helpful. Yeah, this is Jody again from United. I, I definitely agree with you. And I think that would be that's going to be part of the second training that we do provide on billing, documentation, coding, and so forth. And if you take a look at that in this presentation, that um, CMS 1500 form that was there, snapshot of that, that's really going to help you all understand what's required to submit to us, whether on paper or electronically. You know, most of the MCOs, I know we require electronic, you know, but we can go into that in the second training. And as you meet with, you know, the different MCOs, as, as was stated earlier, we all have onboarding training once the contract and everything is in place. We're not going to just say, okay, you're contracted, you figure it out. You know, we want, we want this to be successful as well. So with the additional training coming down the line and then working with your individual MCOs and the contacts that you develop and the relationships you build there, I, I think we'll all be able to give. But I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we'll be able to give you what you need. I do agree with that. Hey, Gwen, it's Joe Glinka uh, from Highmark Whole Care. Just listening to all this and certainly welcome everybody to the call. Well, did this be an appropriate time to maybe share a little bit about what the MCO's prompt payment requirements are uh, that might set uh, the doulas as new providers at ease a little bit because they are um, they're, they're prescribed. Yeah, I think that's something we could we could talk about briefly now, or that's something that we could add into the billing uh, conversation that we'll hold separately in the future. It may be it may make sense to to save that for the billing part, but um, if you think you can do it in a sound bite, <laughs> by all means. Well, I, in, a, in a nutshell, I mean, we, the MCOs are held within that, um, 
was that 95 percent of our clean claims need to be paid within 30 days and then and then as as claims have to be researched i mean there are other milestones that need to be achieved in order for the mcos to be able to comply with their agreement with the, with the department and that's put in that that's helpful to the providers so the providers are getting paid uh in an appropriate amount of time and and that we can you know uh keep our records and encounter and claim information um organized and and tight if you will well, how was that glenn thanks joe yeah i i think the the, the big takeaway there is that once you've submitted a claim that that properly documents everything it needs to pro, uh, document it, it gets paid pretty quickly um another question here from from teresa in the chat in the context of maternal support services how do the mcos handle situations involving canceled visits particularly those within a short notice like one hour um, and, and additionally asking if you could elaborate on your approach to in-person services and the integration of telehealth options uh, for birthing individuals under your care. Ensuring flexibility and responsiveness in the face of sudden changes is crucial and understanding the balance between in-person and telehealth services would be valuable for their exploration. So any MCOs that would like to talk about uh, how, how short notice cancellations get handled from from a billing perspective and and also any any uh, thoughts on approaches to telehealth services being balanced with in person. Yeah, again, I'll jump in quickly, but certainly welcome others feedback from a, uh, a missed appointment perspective. Uh, they are not payable if the service wasn't rendered. There is no payment uh, for, for a service that wasn't rendered. Um, as it relates to telehealth services, uh, yes, we do have telehealth policies in place, and that really, really became more uh, prominent uh, during the early days of COVID, I, I think, across all of our organizations. Um, we've modified some of the approaches to the telehealth policy over the last couple of years. Uh, we can certainly make that available um, to the providers to make sure that they understand those. And it's Jody again from United. I totally agree, and we have the same process. You know, no-shows are not a, a billable service. And um, we also have policies on telehealth, and that would be part of the onboarding process as well. And this is Kim in AmeriHealth Keystone. We work the same way. Thank you, everyone. We've got just a, a few more minutes during our our time together and so I think I'll, I'll take this opportunity to kind of go over what things you can expect uh, from the department and from the MCOs uh, moving forward. After this meeting, um, I will distribute to all attendees the slides that we used for today's presentation as well as a spreadsheet with all of the MCOs contact information. I will also include um, a glossary that, that Emily alluded to that is a glossary of terms related to Medicaid for anybody who is curious about all of those. Um, and we'll include some links for the provider enrollment training that was offered on, on January 10th, as well as a link to the PA certification board um, for, the, um, for the credential that's required in order to be enrolled. Um, I would also direct your attention to the chat here uh, where Linda included a link for a survey that the uh, commission is asking you to fill out um, to, to just get your thoughts on some things. So please, if you are a doula attendee, absolutely fill out that survey. Um, we will also be in touch with additional training opportunities, you know, more sessions like this as we begin to work through some more of the details about billing and payment rates. Uh, so you can look forward to some calendar holds uh, coming forward on that. And I would just really encourage you, you know, that next week, once it becomes time to start submitting your enrollment applications to the department for provider enrollment, that after that point, um, you get familiar with, with the MCO points of contact uh, that you're going to be working with through this process. And if there's anything at all that I can do to help um, in terms of maybe directing you to the right place uh, or helping you figure out how to, to phrase your questions in a way that will make sense to the managed care organizations, I'm really happy uh, to be in that role for you. And I know that the, the folks at the doula commission, I won't speak for them, but um, they have really proven themselves uh, to be wonderful resources for, for um, helping you out as well. So any, any final remarks perhaps from from Emily on behalf of the MCOs or from Jaria on behalf of the doulas. 
Maria, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you for providing this information. I think we got, uh, I had a lot of questions answered and I think that some of the questions that we have had in the chat have been answered fairly well and we're going to continue to look forward to more education opportunities so that we can all be prepared and work together. I also want to let everyone in attendance know that we invite you to subscribe to the newsletter on the Pennsylvania Doula Commission website. All of the resources that uh, Gwen has shared and that have been shared throughout today's presentation, we are going to also share directly to every, everyone who's been subscribed to the website to make sure that you get it. Sometimes, um, nothing against DHS, the website is kind of challenging to find things. And so whenever we get things from DHS, as soon as we get it, we distribute it to everyone. And so if you are not already subscribed, please uh, make sure you do that. I'll put the link in the chat again while we're still talking. Thank you. Thanks, Jaria. And we will own that critique. It is true that our, our website is not the most user friendly. So use Jaria's website. It's better than ours. Emily. Well, I just really wanted to just say thank you to Gwen, Jaria, the commission and all the MCOs, you know, that are on the line for helping, you know, get everything together today. So that's it. Thank you all. Your your participation is much appreciated, and uh, we're we're really looking forward to seeing what 2024 and the years beyond have in store uh, for doulas and for doula services to to our members. So thank you all. Take care. <laughs>